Good morning, Life Church. How you all doing this morning? Come on, why don't you stand on our feet? We're going to worship our God. We have a special service for you this morning. Come on, here we go. Where can I go that you don't know? Where would I be if not for your love? God, I receive your grace and peace. It's not what I've done, but what you've done in me. Say we will not be moved. You're standing with us. We will not be moved when everything around. But we will trust, oh trust in your name, we're holding fast to your promises, what you have spoken will surely come to pass, say we will not be moved, you're standing with us, we will not be moved, when everything around is shaking, you're not changing, we will not be Church, we won't be moved this morning. Here we go. Hey. And we sing like this. Oh, I'm still standing. Oh, I'm standing still. And if I fall, I know you catch me. You won't let go. You never will. Whoa.
Love is broken. 
Welcome to all of you guys on behalf of the Life Church. My name is Cassie Leal, and we are so very thankful that you're here today. You guys can go ahead and take your seats. And we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge any special guests that we have here. If it's your first time, welcome. We're so thankful that you're here. Yes, 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 yes. And we would love for you to let us know that you're here. So there is a connection card. You might have sat on it. If you can fill this out, it'll let us know that we're able to contact you, say thank you for coming, and most importantly, you will get this special gift as a thank you for coming today. This is with the guest experience team, so right as you leave, you can grab one of those. I wanna read a verse for you in first, or sorry, in John, it's chapter eight, verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He brought life to us by conquering death and the important, important piece is that he came during Christmas for us. So he came from heaven because he loves you and he wants to connect with you. We wanted to go ahead and let you know that during the service, we do have a few special elements. There's a few more songs. There's going to be some lighting effects. There will be some moments of darkness. And we wanted to go ahead and let you guys know that um, if you did need to get up at all, we do have ushers available with lights to lead you to the bathroom, but it is going to be a special moment. So we'd love for you to remain seated during that time. Let's go ahead and take a look at what's happening at the Life Church, guys. Welcome to the Life Church. On behalf of our senior pastors, John and Leslie Siebling, we're so glad you're here with us today. Each weekend, we have services at multiple locations around Memphis, New York, Massachusetts, DC Metro, Santiago, Chile, Florence, Italy, and online, where you can be a part of worship, hear an encouraging message, and enter an environment that is welcoming and friendly. Check out one of our Next Steps areas to learn more about Kids Life and Axis. Kids Life is an experience for children six weeks through fifth grade that has age-specific classes just for them. Axis is our ministry for students 6th through 12th grade that meet on Wednesday nights for dynamic services based on God's Word. We're all about helping people get connected, and the best way to get started is by taking your next step. Whether it's building life-giving relationships by joining a life group that interests you or learning more about the Life Church through our discovery experience, we'd love to get you planted in church. Find more information about all of our next steps at thelifechurch.com. God has an incredible plan for your life, and we'd love for you to be a part of all that's taking place here at the Life Church.
you guys were bringing missions trips back in January. If you guys wanted to learn more about it, join us for that meeting. It's January 15th online at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll go ahead and share the dates, the locations, and how you guys can plug in and be the hands and feet of Jesus with us over this next year. I wanted to welcome you guys, stand to your feet, say hi to your friends, and we'll just go ahead and get the service started. 30 seconds.
At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary to whom he was engaged who was now expecting a child. And while they were there the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appearing among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. And seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them.
and sin and devour by name till he appeared and the soul found its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder praise. A new
Um, I am so excited right now to kind of peer my face in and to just have an opportunity to be present with you guys this Sunday morning. And I just wanted to say hi. And so I have this thought that's been on my heart and on my mind during the season, and I just wanted to share it with you. If you are uh, brand new and we haven't had a chance to kindle and to meet, uh, just be patient. I'll be coming back to see you as well. And if you are a regular in the house, I love you and I miss you and looking forward to what God is going to do in the new year. Uh, this is the thought for those of you who are taking down notes because, you know, I'm not preaching today, so don't make me jump through this screen and land on the stage and start teaching. But this is the thought. God is a God of intentionality. He's an intentional God. And because he's eternal and he can see everything, past, present, and future, and because he's sovereign, he has absolute rule and control and authority, he's intentional about everything. And that means this. When God is doing something and he allows us to see it, he's doing something. But when God is doing nothing, he's still doing something, even when you can't see it. Why? Because he's a God of intentionality. So whether we're fortunate enough and blessed enough to see God's hand moving in our lives and we can see it, we celebrate, that's wonderful. But I want all of us to slow down to know that even when you don't see God moving, because he's still God and he's intentional, even when he's doing nothing, God is still doing something because he's intentional. So therefore, that means that we all have to hold on to this fruit of the spirit called patience. <laughs> Everybody say patience. We got to hold on to patience because patience is that thing that allows us to take the journey to trust God in a process when we don't see him doing something, but we understand he's so loving and so intentional, we know he's doing something. <laughs> I'm getting excited right now. <laughs> so let's hold on to patience. I think about that as I think about Christmas. Here is Jesus coming through the corridors of time. He's about to make his entrance, but for years... We had a promise in Genesis chapter 3 that Jesus was coming. But Adam didn't get to see Jesus, although he heard about this messianic promise in Genesis chapter 3. Abraham didn't get to see Jesus, although he heard about the promise. These guys had to be patient, and they had to wait patiently until they can see the promise. Moses didn't get to see Jesus. These guys did not get to touch, hold, experience that promise, but they had to, by faith, embrace patience as they trusted a God who would always keep his promise. And the Bible says, referring to Christmas, right? This is that time. In Genesis chapter 3, um, Galatians chapter 3, it says this, in the fullness of time, Jesus was born of a woman, born under law. Jesus came at God's appointed time based on God's calendar, not necessarily ours. And I love that big idea because Jesus came at God's timing. Sometimes when God looks like he is delaying a process, it's right on time when it comes to God. So I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited about tomorrow. And I would say this, I went to New York City uh, at the Life Church with Pastor Wayne and he was preaching last week. And he said this in his message and it's, it marked my memory like a tattoo. And he said, the power of God is often revealed in the pace of God. So remember that that God's power is going to be manifested in his pace, his timing. Our job is while we're waiting, understanding that God is intentional. So when we see him doing something, we celebrate it because we see it. But when he's not doing anything based on what we see, he's still doing something behind the scenes. And we trust him with this fruit called patience that our God is still in control. I'm excited about it. I'll end with this verse because I want to introduce uh, Paul as he comes up to bring the message uh, this morning. This is the verse in Gal uh, Galatians chapter uh, 6, verse 9. The Bible says, don't get tired of doing good. That's for everybody. There's not one verse in the Bible that you will see where it encourages us to don't get tired of doing evil because the flesh doesn't need support. It's going to do wrong if you don't do anything to discipline it. But the Bible says you will get exhausted in doing good. And I want to invite you and encourage you. Tap into the fruit of the Spirit. Let's lean in during this season. And let's not get tired of doing good because the verse says that all of us will reap a harvest. There's a reward coming if we just don't give up. My God, I'm excited about this right now. I'm excited teaching this small little segment right now during this holiday season. They waited for Jesus. And when he came, it was in God's best timing. And whatever you believe in God for right now, and whatever I'm believing God for right now, we're going to hold on to the fruit of patience and believe God for his best 
Tommy. Do me a favor. We're going to introduce uh, Paul. The Bible has its own Apostle Paul. We have our own Disciple Paul. And do me a favor. This is a house of honor. We like to honor up. We like to honor down and we like to honor all around. And this is the season that I've been seeing Paul really put his hand to the plow and he's not looking back. He's really fixed on the things of God. And I just want to encourage you to, let's say, let's encourage him right now. So if you don't mind, stand to your feet. Let's put our hands together and welcome our very own Paul Tariq. Hey, y'all. What's up? What's up? Okay, I'm feeling that vibe. That's my Axis crew, man. What up, y'all? That was my daughter yelling, Dre. I love that. Every morning we wake up, Dre, I want you to be like that to your dad. I love you, dad! I'm going to make you eggs! Yes! Anyways, y'all can be seated. I love y'all so much. What's up? Wasn't that special uh, hearing from our pastor? Wasn't that good? I'm like, pastor, we got to get you on there just to say what's up. I thought somebody drank out of this water. I was like, y'all set me up? <laughs> set me up with a dirty water? <laughs> nah, but um, you know what's funny too is that as I was sitting there, I was like, oh man, I gotta preach. It's always hard to come up here after you hear anything from Pastor Emmy. <laughs> he set me up. I'm like, yo, can we do it at the end of service? So I, you know what I'm saying? You guys are like, we want pastor. And then here comes Paul like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, man, I love you guys so much. And I pray today's word is a blessing to you guys. Um, I feel like the first service went amazing. Uh, yeah, I thought it was good, man. Anytime we talk about the love of Jesus, the love of God, I think it does something to all of us, right? So let me start like this. Um, today we celebrate, we want to reflect back on Jesus. So I have a scripture here in Isaiah. It says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I love that scripture. And I said it like this. I love this. It says, a thousand times in history, a baby has become a king. But only one time in history has a king become a baby. Isn't that good? <laughs> only one time has that ever happened, and that's Jesus. He was up there in heaven with the angels and with God just having a grand old time. And then God said, I got a plan for you. You got to go down there. Say what? Like if I was Jesus, I'd be like, say what? We cooling right now. What happened? But um, he had to send his son for us to reveal the love of God. Um, so that's my plan today is just to talk about a few things on why Jesus had to come. And uh, I only got 17 more minutes, so I'm going to try to maximize this time. So a few questions that I had on my mind. Let's give it up for Tim real quick as he's slowly exiting. He's like, bam, bam, bam. I love that. You can stay up here all service if you want. Um, so I had this question. I was thinking, I said, man, thinking about God, I said, were we really on his mind in this whole plan, right? Did he really think of a plan that included us, me, Paul, Jackie, Kathy, Lisa? And God so big, what was his focus, right, with all this, the creation, the heavens, the earth, the mountains, the oceans? What was all this for? What is it? So Ephesians says it like this, Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 in the message. It says, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind. Isn't that comforting? Before any of this happened, the stars, he was like, I have a people in mind that I love so much. He had you in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of his love. Isn't that powerful just to think? God was thinking about you. He said, I have, I am love, and I have to place this somewhere, and I'm going to create a people that I could put it on. That's everything. He's just, you guys are his everything. He said, to be made whole and holy by his love, long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. And I love this in the, in the message. What pleasure he took in planning this. Isn't that awesome? I love it. So God had you and still has you on his mind. I love this quote. It says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, all this stuff, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. 
So my plan, like I said, I just wanted to share a few thoughts. And one of the ways, one of the reasons why Jesus had to come was, number one, to reveal the Father, okay, to reveal him. What did he look like? How did he move? What was he thinking? In John 1.18, the Bible says, no one has ever actually seen God, but, of course, his only son has. For he is the companion of the Father and has told us all about him. And I love this in Hebrews. It says, the exact representation and perfect imprint of his father's essence. That's Jesus. So when we see Jesus talk, when we see him move, who did he talk to? What did he do? Who did he heal? We get to see what was on God's mind and what was in his heart. So Jesus spoke God's words. He thought his thoughts, he expressed his emotions, and he did his works. And I believe this, that without Jesus, we would never know God's love, right? So seeing Jesus revealed it. And, and I love this. We should all quote this right now. John 3, 16. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Oh, man. Yeah, you can clap on that one. God loves you. And I wanted to break this down. If you were ever unsure of how much God loves you, you are probably thinking of the wrong love, okay? Slow down with me for one second. There are several different types of love, but I just want to mention two right now. There is one type of love that loves because the object is valuable, right? This is the common type of love. You love it because it's valuable. You know, your new countertops that you got for Christmas, your gift, your Christmas tree, my nice Christmas sneakers, my nice red jacket that I left the tags on this morning and I looked like a <laughs> nerd. <laughs> I was like, man, and, and on this turtleneck too, on both of them. I'm like, dude, help me. I need scissors. And the second type of love is that the love that gives value to the object, okay? Not because the object is valuable, but it gives value. So take a moment right now and think about your childhood cuddle toy. Think about that thing. You probably still got it, Shayna. Yeah, you do. Or that blankie that you had, something. Y'all had something as a child, and it meant so much to you, right? And it probably wasn't perfect. It was probably stinky and old, right? Probably had dirt on it and holes, and it was flawed. But you loved that toy, didn't you? And I have one. I have one. Dree, toss our family toy. <laughs> nice toss, yo. This was our, This is my family. This is Chester. This is Chester. My, my youngest daughter was like, he ain't got no nose. I know. He's broken. It's ridiculous. He stinks. Dirty. I don't know. We've had this thing for like, what, over 20 years, Dre? My, my sister had this as her cuddle toy, and then she gave it to my oldest, and she's 15 now, and she's been riding with this forever. This dude goes on every vacation, cruise, Dominican Republic. This, he's had more of a greater life than I have at this point. <laughs> I'm like, yo, Chester, you the man. But honestly, there's nothing really valuable about Chester. He can't do nothing. He don't talk. You know, when you could pull the string, and, how are you? He don't do none of that. He's just here with no nose, nothing. It's not expensive, no tricks, no nothing. But we all love Chester, don't we, Dre? You love Chester. And this bear is, is valuable to us, though. I don't care what you think. I don't know what kind of value you place on it. But it's valuable to me and my family. And that's exactly how God views you. The broken, a rag doll, ain't got much. But man, does he love you. He values you. He loves you so much. I need you to get this this morning. I need you to feel that. Chester, you're going to chill with me. He's going to chill with me the rest of the service. Okay? There we go. God has never looked at you or myself in the mirror and wished that he saw somebody else. I need you to know that. We are all flawed and broken and wounded. and There's nothing hidden from God. That's what's crazy. The scars on the outside and the secrets on the inside. Y'all got them. Y'all got them. I got them. You got them. We all got them. And God sees it all. And nonetheless, he's the one that loves you most. Isn't that wild to think? I love the Bible. It says in Romans 5.8, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still rag dolls, broken, disobeying, just breaking the heart of God, he died for us. That's how much he loved us. Isn't that powerful just to really think about that? The great basis of Christian assurance is not how much our hearts are set on God, but how unshakably his heart is set on us. We got to get this, church. We got to get this. 
He doesn't look for what's worthy in the object, but it's the kind of love that gives worth to the object. Lastly, I'll say it like this. Our God doesn't love you because you are worthy, but God's love makes you worthy. You are worthy because the value that God puts on you. If I could have one message. Is that Denise? Oh, my good Lord. Sorry, I just saw someone I love. Um, If I could preach one message, to be honest, it would probably be this one right here. To let people know how much God loves you. And I think the church, man, has done a disservice to the body and to the world by putting these obligations and these tasks and these requirements and these these levels that you got to reach to obtain the level and love of God. It's not true. Yes, do we want to look more like Christ once we serve him and give up, give him our whole everything? Of course. But that doesn't make you approved in the eyes of God by doing this first. Just say yes to him. Just say yes to him. So he came to reveal the love of God to us. Number two is God sent Jesus to reveal that lost people matter to God. Hallelujah. Lost people. How many were lost at one point but are found? And there's probably some people in this room right now that may still be lost, but I got to let you know that you matter to Jesus. Okay? One of the main reasons that Jesus came to earth was to fulfill God's plan of saving the lost. And Luke 1910, the Bible says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And I love this is because this is what it was like for me. This was my life. Many times during Jesus' ministry, he looked to forgive those who the self-righteous leaders of the day shunned. That was me. I was the dude on the shun side. I was bad. I was on the outskirts. I was not living according to the Christian standard, right? Jesus was criticized for eating with tax collectors and sinners, and once again, Jesus responded by setting his mission again. I was that dude that Jesus came and sat with. You don't understand how much you reveal the love of God within your heart when you start to look around and see who you're sitting with. If you only getting around Christian people, I want to challenge you. Start getting around some people to express the love and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you to get on them. People need your love. People need to hear about Jesus and know that there's a deeper love in this world. So like I said, Jesus was criticized for eating with people like Paul. And I thank God he did, man. I thank God someone was bold enough. My man Isaiah, he used to cut my hair. Now I know why for two hours at a time. And he would just be like, hey, P, you know how much God loves you? And at that time, I was like, bro, just cut my hair. I got a date to go on. What you talking? But nonetheless, he was planting seeds. And one day, he took me to a Christian concert. And boy, did Jesus rock my world. He really did. But it took so much time for me to, I, I, I began to lean into Isaiah and be like, yo, I like this dude. Like, he's sharing something I never heard before. None of my other homies was telling me, yo, God loves you. You know, on the surface, we'd be like, yo, what's that mean? But on the inside, I'm like, does he really? <laughs> yo, these dudes who walk around here with big muscles, don't be fronting. You got, you got a heart on there? And Man, listen. Listen. But, man, I remember going out to the altar just giving my everything to Jesus. And he touched me, and I was uncontrollably. Uh, JoJo was there. <laughs> just as I was thinking, my man right here was there. I was probably the only white dude in the building. <laughs> Tell me not, Joe. And they said, if you're feeling Jesus tonight, come down to the altar. I was like, what are we about to get, a gift card? <laughs> now, this is where I was. I didn't know nothing about church, y'all. But I said, man, I am feeling Jesus. He loves me. Let me go try this thing. All of a sudden, this Spanish dude came and laid his hand on my head. At this, this whole time, for years, I thought he was just praying in Spanish. And so I knew that there was a thing called tongues, and he was praying in the spirit. And, boy, I was just shaking and crying, and I was falling. I'm like, Joe, what's happening? Jesus was touching me and saving me and telling me how much, man, the feeling that I had in that moment never made me question God ever again in my life. And I pray in this time, if you never felt the presence of God fill you with his love, I pray that you would experience that because there's nothing more powerful than the love of God when it touches home in your heart. Man, I promise you something. But anyways, back to the scripture that I was planning to share three minutes ago. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? This ain't right. He's not doing it right. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, man, but it's the sick. And I'm adding my own kind of lingo in there, of course, but nonetheless, you see the scripture. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come 
to call the righteous but sinners. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for coming for someone like me. Amen. So that's Jesus' goal was to save. There's two groups of people, right, two kinds of people. There's saved people and lost people. And everybody in this room right now is in one or the other category, okay? But both groups imply someone loves you. I want you to catch this. This is what's crazy. I was in this study time, and I was like, this is cool. And you have enormous value. You matter to God, okay? In this condition or in that, the last group, Jesus said, you are worthy enough that I want to seek you out. You are worth saving. You are worth finding, Jesus said. See, lostness implies value, okay? You are so valuable that Jesus came to seek and save you. Now watch this. Invaluable things are misplaced, but valuable things are lost. I want you to catch that, okay? A paper clip is misplaced. It's not lost. A toothpick, you misplaced that. A Kleenex is misplaced. It's not lost. You ain't, once you drop your toothpick and it goes under the stove, you ain't like, I need that toothpick. You just go to the pantry and you get out your other toothpick. That one isn't all that special, right? That paper clip, whatever it is, there's not much value on that. But now, if I was to go ahead and lose this wedding ring, how many know that I would lose that wedding ring? That's a problem. That's a, I got to find that wedding ring. That's something that expresses commitment over 10 years with my wife, a love story that represents over 10 years of love. I don't just misplace that. My wife will beat me up if I lose this, okay? So that's just like you, like, you matter to God. That's how much lost people matter to Jesus. You ain't just misplaced. You're lost right now, and he, he's coming to do everything to find you. I said it like this. It's Home Alone season. We had access, right? Access, what's up? On Friday, we had a great party time, which was so cool. But we were watching Home Alone, and one of the things that I love about that movie, and it's so fun, the family of 15 of them, when they're in the airport, and they're like, pass this to Kevin, pass this to Kevin, pass this to Kevin, pass this to Kevin. Have any of y'all seen Home Alone? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then all of a sudden it hits the end and they're like, Kevin? And he's not there. And they're like, Kevin's not here. 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 The mom gets it. Kevin's not here. And then she's like, what? <laughs> Kevin's not here? She almost loses it. I think that's what happens with Jesus, right? Like Jesus is like, Shane is not here? What do you mean Shane is not here? And they go, and they got to try to get there and seek out her boy, just like God seeked you out, Shana. I didn't know which word that was, but it seeked you out, Shana. And that's what he's doing with every lost person. He's like, Kevin's not here, and I need Kevin. And I'm doing everything possible to get on the next flight, to get there, to go through the snow, to do everything, put Christmas on hold, to presents on hold, leave my family to go get Kevin. And that's what Jesus does for each and every one of you. And I love this when you got some more time to look at Luke 15, just to show you the expression of God. Luke 15 talks about three different parables, a lost coin, a lost sheep, right, and a lost son. And just watch the eager pursuit after the thing that was lost. And once he finds that thing, watch, at the end of each one, he throws a party. And he expresses in joy how happy they are because they found that lost thing, that lost person. Amen? And that's us. That's Jesus. So Jesus goes after those that are lost because they are valuable and you are valuable. Amen? Amen. And lastly, why God sent Jesus to do away with sin. All right? To do away with sin. And the Bible says, for Christ didn't enter the earthly version of the holy place. He entered the place itself. And I love this. And offered himself to God as a sacrifice for whose sins? For our sins. Do we got that scripture up there? For our sins. He doesn't do this every year as the high priest did under the old plan with blood that was not their own. If that had been the case, he would have to sacrifice himself repeatedly throughout the course of history. That's what's crazy. They used to sacrifice animals, and that blood wasn't strong enough to cover all the sins of the world. But think about how powerful the blood of Jesus is that he had to come and spill it one time. And he said, all sins are canceled. Past, present, and future, they gone. If you in Jesus, you covered by the blood of Jesus. It's still wet today, and it's still too powerful. You are made right with God because of that blood. That's how powerful that blood is. Don't ever estimate, underestimate the power of the blood. Amen? Side note. 
but he would uh, have to sacrifice himself throughout the course of history, but instead he sacrificed himself once and for all, summing up all the other sacrifices in this sacrifice of himself, the final solution of sin, right? So when he was hung high and stretched wide, he said, it is finished, and he did that for us. That, and you know what's crazy? I was reading too, and Isaiah says that God had pleasure in putting his guilt on Jesus for us. Are you kidding me? I couldn't ever think about wounding my own child. Like, what? And he made, he beat Jesus up so bad for you that he was disfigured that they couldn't even tell he was a human anymore. Imagine that beat down, and God said, it was my pleasure. Imagine God sitting in a room with you, and that was my pleasure to do that for you. Are you serious? Man, that's deep, y'all. Y'all catching that right now? Like, I'm like, whoa, again, you caught me, Lord. Like, wow. So I look at it like this. There's three great transfers. Number one was Adam's guilt to us, right? Adam sinned, and he brought in sin to the world, and it made us all broken and in, separ in, in separation from God, right? All of us. It's just the way it is because Adam did that. But God had to come up with a plan and be like, I need to get back in relationship with them because they matter to me. And remember, the whole th the reason why I'm doing all this is so I could give my love to them, Right? So all of a sudden, the great transfer, the next one is our guilt to Jesus. So God takes that transfer. He takes everything wrong with you, Maya, and Brittany, and he says, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to give it to Jesus. And then lastly, we see Jesus' righteousness to us. So everything perfect about Jesus, God says, I see Jesus as this perfect person, and I'm going to add that perfectness on you. So now I see you as perfect. Oh, my goodness, if you think number one is unfair, how unfair is number three? Right? We talk about, man, this ain't no fair. I'm a sinner. Yeah, but in Jesus, you're righteous, and you have no right to be righteous. We didn't do nothing to gain this righteousness. And that's why I try to call out everybody. It's not about earning and deserving. You can't add another tally to your works. You can't serve another food pantry or do another event to say, God, do you love me more? No, you're already at a 100 and billion, gazillion percent. I can't add no more. You already are loved. You are loved. You can't be any more loved, and you can't be any less loved. So when you fall or when you fell yesterday, he doesn't say, ah, tally, gone. No, you're still at 100. And you just repent. You say, Jesus, I thank you again for the blood. We always just go back to the blood. Anytime you fall, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and purify you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Just confess it and go back. That's why in worship I come down and I'm just li lifting my hands in worship. God, I'm a broken man still and always will be. I've been doing this a long time, this Christian walk. And I haven't got any more perfected really. I mean, I've gained and got mature, but I'm still broken. And every time I fail, it's another thing that it's just we could never measure up, man. We could never measure up. That's all I got to say is you'll never be able to measure up. So whatever that next thing is that you're saying, once I get there, God will make me approved. And then I'll serve the house of God. And then I'll counsel. And then I'll, no, no, you'll never get there. You'll never get there. Because once you get there, there's going to be a next thing that you need to do to be right with God. No, you're just right with God. Simply and because, Jesus, you're right with God. I can't, I can't wear this out enough. Whew some water the Bible says this is one of my favorite scriptures 2 Corinthians 5 21 Christ had no sin but God made him become sin God did this for us so that in Christ we could become right with God there it is it's one of the reasons God sent Jesus to do away with our sin amen hey Joe come here real quick just for illustration purposes I got this red jacket it's pretty clean Saw my um my tag was still on it, but this is this is Joe, right? Shout out to Joe. <laughs> Thank you for this illustration purpose, Joe. So this was us in human form when we came into the world, and this is us covered in sin. And God's like this, and He's saying, "Man, sin has now separated me from the people that I love, and because I'm a holy and righteous God, I can't have no part in sin. But I need to get back in relationship with my people that I love." So he says, you know what, looking around heaven, 
what in heaven is perfect beyond measure? Oh, I see Jesus. Where angel at? Oh, there's Jesus. Stand right there, angel. Don't move any forward. There's Jesus. He's perfect. He's white as snow. He is purity. He is pure in the finest form. He is without blemish. He says, I need to send you, Jesus. Jesus probably like, say again. I need to send you, son. And I need to put this on you so I can be in relationship with my kids again. So Jesus comes to earth. Come over here now, angel. And now when God sees Jesus, who was perfect, and he, this is what he did. He saw Jesus, and he sent him, and he said, all right, I'm going to take this. I'm going to give this to Joe. And then I'm going to take Joe's sin, all this brokenness, everything wrong with you. Terrible. All this stuff in you is just bad, but I love you. I love you. And he takes the sin, and he says, Jesus, here you go, man. <laughs> That's all on you, man. That's all on you. And then he takes this perfect thing of Jesus, this righteousness and everything holy about Jesus. And he says, and now, Jesus, I got to take this from you and I got to put it on them. And now every time when Jesus sees you or God sees you, he looks through not only was this sin that he took, but it was also blood that he spilled. And every time he sees this blood, he looks through the blood and he sees you white as snow. Y'all see that? Every time he sees you, he looks through Jesus and says the reason why he's white is because this blood had made him white. It's nothing you could do. Y'all could go down there, take my jacket, it's all good. You can't have it though. I need y'all to know that, man. It's nothing that you could do to measure up. The Bible says like this, Christ sacrificed his life's blood to set us free, which means our sins are now forgiven. Christ did this of because of God's gift of undeserved grace to us. We can't miss this church. For a long, long time, I always thought I had to measure up and do more for the things of God. I need to do this. I need to do outreach. I need to go. And those things are all beautiful. But those things don't make you right with God. The one and only thing that makes you right with God is Jesus. And what I need to say, if you're not just and only relying and sitting and resting in Jesus... You're not expressing the gospel the right way. Does that make sense? Like you're not receiving the gospel the right way. It's just resting in Jesus. It's just thanking him for his blood that made you white as snow. And that's what I love. This scripture says in Isaiah 118. And we're, we're going we're gonna to sing in a moment as the worship's here. And we're going to reflect on Jesus one more time. And then I'm going to come back up. And I'm going to share something. And I, I hope that everybody leaves here trusting in the Lord. Amen. But I love this scripture. It says, come on now. Let's discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins are bright as red, all of ours, they will become as white as snow because of the blood of Jesus. Though they are dark red, they will become as white as wool. Just always look at that. In my position in Christ, God sees me through his son. And that's a great place to be. Well, what I want to do right now is I want to worship Jesus with one more song. And like I said, I'll be right back. All right? But let's right now, let's reflect on Jesus, okay? All right, come on, Chester.
for Jesus. Yeah. Let's get up for the worship team too, can we? Wasn't that great? Woo! Y'all can take a deep breath now. That was a lot of preparation, man. These people have been working tirelessly and endlessly to do that. Wasn't that good? One more time for our worship team! And Marcos, huh? <laughs> Man, that's awesome. So this is what I wanted to do. Um, y'all enjoy that message? Y'all feel loved by Jesus? I hope so. And I hope you really feel it. And I hope you really got that in your spirit, how loved that you are. But I had a scripture. Ellie, if you could put it up. This is what it boils down to. This is the greatest news. For by his loving favor, by his grace, you have been saved from the punishment of sin through faith. Through what? One more time. Through what? It is not by anything you have done. You see it? Keep going. It is a gift of God. How many people love gifts? It's Christmas time. Y'all got, your trees are probably full. <laughs> you guys love gifts. It is a gift of God. It is not given to you because you work for it. Man, you see the language here? You don't work for it. You didn't deserve it. It's a gift. If you could have worked for it, you would have been proud. And then here's the last one. This is how easy it is. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, thank you. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is that hard? It's one of the easiest things that I've seen. I, I don't know how the gospel was expressed to you at some point in your life, if it ever has been. But it's not hard. It's Jesus. He did all the hard work. He did everything. I heard this one time and said, if a loving God loves people so much, why would he send them to hell? Man, listen, we were already, all of us because of Adam, we were already on our way to hell. But this is what happened. He said, I love them so much, I need to come up with a plan again to get them saved. I need them on this lifeboat. So let me ask you this. If you were on that Titanic and a ship was going down and a big white shark was about to eat you up, would you say, I'm just going in with it? Or if there was a lifeboat, would you say, get me on the lifeboat? If I was like, come on in, would you say, no, nah, I'm going down. I want to get eaten. How many people would do that? Well, maybe if you're sad and depressed, but if that's the case, you won't receive Jesus right now and things are going to change for you. Yeah. I'm going to say that. I don't know who that was for, but some people may think, no, nah, I just want to give up. I would go to that shark because life is tough. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing, man. Let's give your life to Jesus, and I pray that he, and he just steps in and he makes things happen for you. Amen. And I'm not saying that things will get perfect because I promise you they won't. Man, as a Christian, sometimes the heat gets turned up because now you are a threat to the enemy. I'm serious, y'all, but it's okay because we got a great reward in heaven. I don't know who that was for. That was total sidebar. Now, that's what God did with Jesus. He said, I'm going to send you, and all they got to do is jump in you. Just say yes to Jesus. I believe. I received that gift. Now, if that's anybody in here and you, number one, who haven't did that yet, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes. And I also want to say it for those Christians who was like myself, who wasn't just fully devoted in, in sitting and resting in that truth. You thought that you was the man cranking, doing the motor thing and doing the paddling. No, no, you don't got to do none of that. You just jump in the raft boat and you just get to the island. Boom. You don't got to do nothing but sit there. That's the first step. And by being rested in Jesus, then here comes the expression of your love for him. Because it's like, God has done so much for me that I wake up and I'm excited to give the word to people. I'm excited to serve people who are broken. Because he's done such a great thing for me. But it starts with just resting and leaning into Jesus. One last thing. I, I know I'm over time a little bit, but I see... Peter and John, and there was a difference between Peter and John. Peter at the end of the supper was like, I'll do anything for you, Jesus. I'll go to the cross for you. I'll do it all, Peter, his loud mouth. I'll never betray you. And then we got John, who the scripture says he was rested on, on Jesus' bosom, just resting on Jesus, just rested. And at the end of the day, when things got rough and things got hard, Peter, the one who said, I, all my works, I'm going to do for you, Jesus, I'm going to do, he was the one who betrayed Jesus, but the one who said, I'm just resting, just trust in Jesus, man. He was at the foot of the cross. Come on, that's got to be us. There's nothing you can do. So if you were that Christian who keeps saying, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, 
I want you to shift your perspective right now. Maybe that's that moment. I had that moment for me, and it's been life-changing. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, as we love to do, to give you your privacy and your intimacy with Jesus, if you, number one, have never said yes to the free gift of salvation, where now you can say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you died for me and you spilled your blood and you were buried and rose for me. And all I got to do is say yes and believe that and I have eternity with God. This is for you. And secondly, lastly, if you have not been resting in Jesus alone, but you have subtly incorporated some of your works, I want to give you this time to raise your hand as well. On the count of three, I want to, whoever feels, yes, I want to reset or I want a fresh start with God, I want you to go ahead and raise your hand at the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Go ahead and raise your hand. I see them. I see all those hands. I see all those fresh starts with Jesus. Oh, good Lord, I thank you. I see all the hands. Thank you. Thank you. And right now, this is what I, I want to do collectively. Can we all pray together? Y'all ready? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus, the perfect gift for me. I receive you as my Savior. I know that you died for me. You took my sin. You were buried for me. And you rose for me. And because of that, I have life with God. I am in right standing with God because of Jesus. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, y'all. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. If you just said that prayer for the first time, or maybe if you were like me and you were laying it all and resurrendering, we wanted to celebrate with you. We wanted to know about that decision, and we want to give you a gift. You can scan this QR code, and it'll take you to a digital copy of the book. You can pick it up in person by any of our Next Steps section hosts, which are at the back of the stairs, as well as the Next Steps table. And we want to encourage you to fill out this card and let us know about that. There might be a lot of questions that come up as you're reading this book. We do have a life group that's actually going through this. If you wanted to go through as a refresher, we have to lay down our lives every day and pick up what God's giving us. We have the choice to say, I'm going to live his way. And we do that each and every day. And this book will help you with that. So we encourage you to get your copy. And we want to partner with you on it. We also want to encourage you to list your prayer requests or um, praise reports on the back so we can celebrate those with you. And then we wanted to let you guys know about a couple of things in January. We have prayer and fasting starting January 9th, and it's going to go through the 29th. And every Monday night through those three weeks, we do have prayer rallies that are going to be meeting here at 7 p.m. We encourage you to come. It's a focus on prayer, aligning our lives with God, listening to what he's telling us, and just that constant surrender so that through Jesus, not through our works, that we are laying everything down. There is going to be one more song. So right before that, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to reflect on the past year and on everything that God has done in your life. He's been very faithful to us as a church, to us as a community, and I'm sure each and every one of us has something that we are praising and thankful for and something that we're still believing for. So sow these seeds into what you're believing for. And we're going to go ahead and pray that. We have ushers with envelopes and pens. You can scan your QR code and do that digitally. And we're just going to trust God with this offering. Lord, we thank you for the amazing year that you've given us. We thank you for trusting us down here on earth with everything that you've laid before us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we give everything back knowing that you will sow it and grow it. And we are just a little part of what you're doing. We thank you for that and we look forward to serving you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's welcome worship back, guys. You guys can stand up for this one. Let's rise to our feet and, and jam with us this last one, guys.
with the Life Church Massachusetts, we wanted to say Merry Christmas. Next week is Christmas at home, so join in with your jammies, and we'll see you in January. Merry Christmas.